Good people of the Grove. Growth Groups, 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5. And because I have to get through two chapters, I got to get right to the point today. So here's what I'm going to do in this video. I'm going to kind of summarize these two chapters. I think there's four breaks in these two chapters. And then I'm going to get to those three questions that we ask in growth group. So just as a reminder, like uh, these videos are a poor substitute for your personal time with the Lord. If you've not gone with to be with the Lord, if you've not asked him some questions, if you've not gone to the scriptures, pause, stop, end the tape. Do we still call these tapes? End the video and go and be with him. Return to your first love. Uh, don't wait for Moses to come down the mountain because I'm not Moses. I'm a poor substitute for anybody that would have to go up to a mountain. And said, I'm on the mountain with you. And we're all discovering new ways to follow Jesus in all of our lives. So please don't rely on these videos or over rely on them, I should say. Having said that, let's get right to it. So um, first section of chapter four, I've just kind of summarized like this. It's the treasure of the gospel. Uh, Paul is going to basically start to um, answer some questions about his ministry. And as he does so, like there are all sorts of assumptions being made about him. And I think really in this chapter, like there's, there's two chapters, there's one long argument for why Paul is actually someone to be trusted again. Um, you guys know the background of Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians to this point. There's turmoil, there's accusation. Um, and I think in the background, we can start to infer some of the different things that they're saying about him. One is Paul is weak. That's why he says, well, we're, we carry a treasure, this gospel in jars of clay. You're weak. You, you're, your body is decaying. Um, he'll go into like, but we live in a tent in chapter five. Um, the gospel is weak. It, it, it it's actually doesn't even make any sense. And he's like, well, the people that think that are kind of veiled by Satan. Um, so he starts to kind of make an argument based on personal accusation. Like, I don't know what you do with personal accusation, but my first thing isn't to think about how can I persuade people to Christ to, through the power of the gospel based on what they think of me. I'm usually just thinking about, I need to defend me. Paul doesn't think that way and he challenges us to not think that way. And the first thing he says is, and we have a treasure and it is the gospel in the first part of chapter four, right? Yes, there are people that will never understand this, but it is because they are blinded by the God of this age, treasure. Of the gospel. Second part in the last part of chapter 4, verses 7 through 18, I think, and I've just summarized like this we are wasting away, but we are being renewed. That is a paradox of this life, that this world is not our home. We've been talking about this on Sunday, but there is a promise that we are being renewed day by day. Verse 16, I think it's a great summary statement here of this passage, this, uh, uh, this paragraph or so. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. We are in pain. We are longing for a home. Our bodies, though they are in pain, as you get older, if you're a teenager, you don't necessarily feel this. But later, your body will start to feel pain. Um, you do start to feel aches relationally. Um, that is just a reminder of our renewal. Not just of our brokenness, but the promise that God is renewing us here in this world. We are wasting away but we are being renewed by the power of the gospel, by the promise of the guaranteed spirit, uh, all that Paul says right there in that passage. Um, third section in the second chapter, chapter five, um, I think the third little section here that I've looked at is like our truest hope. Our truest hope in verses one through 10, I think are that uh, we will go and be with the Lord, but that's actually not our truest hope. We, it says that we'll be naked in that space. A matter of fact, it says it right there in verse three of chapter five. There's a nakedness in the intermediate state between death and resurrection. So Paul's laying out for us like a lot of us might think that just like being away from the body is our truest hope, that we'll just die and we'll go be with Jesus. That's actually a Gnostic belief uh, that's seeping into the church in Corinth. And he's saying that's not our truest hope. Our truest hope is resurrection. Our truest hope is that there's a permanent dwelling kept in heaven for you not like the tent that you're in now, but yeah, our bodies are weak. Yeah, you know, Paul, you know, may not be very strong, but that's a tent. It's it's temporary. Um, I usually quote this passage actually while I'm at a funeral and I'm doing the graveside service. Um, I usually point to the tent that people are gathered under and I say, the Bible talks about our body, though we might house it for 80 years. We are embodied souls. 
We are souls that have bodies. We're not bodies that have souls. We're souls first. And the body that we have will eventually be struck away. And it's just a temporary dwelling place that at some point there is a permanent building kept for us in eternity. And God says that's our truest hope, not just to die, because even then we will be naked, longing for our permanent dwelling. That's controversial. I understand that to be controversial because we think that heaven is just going to be this place where all of our worries are taken away and all of our pains are done away with. And that's true to an extent. There will still be longings in the intermediate state. Um, it is better to go be with the Lord, as Paul says, than to be here. We want to go be with him than to be here. It's better. Best is eternity when Jesus returns with our resurrected bodies and we then put on our eternal dwelling for all of eternity. That's what where our ultimate hope is. Um, so um, like, if you have more questions about this, I understand that's, that's a little bit disorienting. I'm not trying to make it disorienting, but it is true that there is a nakedness and yet a still longing for the eternal dwelling. Our ultimate hope is a resurrected body, not to just go be with the Lord, but a resurrected body. It is better to go be with the Lord than what we are here, to be clear. All right, enough of over-explaining that controversial statement. But let me now get to the end. And I think the last passage or the last little bit here of uh, these chapters, verses uh, 11 through 21 of chapter 5, it, I could just summarize it by this. We have been reconciled to then reconciled others. And I think you see that all throughout that particular passage, um, those several verses there that, man, this is the end is not that we are reconciled. The end is that we are reconciled and then pursue others' reconciliation with ourselves, but also, more importantly, with the Lord. So those are the four sections in these two chapters that are just kind of summarized, not unpacked. Um, you'll have to do that on your own or you'll do it in your growth groups. But more importantly, we need to get to those three questions that we ask, right? What does this reveal about God? What does this reveal about us? And then what must I do as a result? There's a lot to unpack here, but I'll try to be quick. One um, God, God has a plan for reconciling the world, and that plan to reconcile the world is only through Jesus. Several times through this passage, as you talk about the gospel being explicit only through the reconciliation that is found in Jesus. God has a plan. It is a foreknown, foreknown plan, as we just read in 1 Peter on Sundays. Uh, I think it's like you know chapter 1, like middle of chapter 1. It talks about how Jesus was foreknown by the Father, just as we were foreknown by the Father. But even the plan. Acts chapter 2 talks about the definite plan by the foreknowledge of God that Jesus came to die for sinners. It is a definite, foreknown, certain plan, and it is very unique. It is very narrow. There are no other plans to save humanity except through, through Jesus. That's one. Two, he also has a plan for our bodies. I have already mentioned this, but in chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, he talks about how like uh, our bodies now are temporary. They're important. Take care of your body, both with medicine and internally and also through physical fitness and diet. Like Those things matter and how God's designed you. Uh, take care of your body. It is not good to neglect the body. We are, again, we are embodied souls. So you not know what to do with your body, with your soul, if you don't know what to do with your body. So there, it is important, um, and yet it is temporary. Um, we will be naked, quote unquote, verse 3 says, in an intermediate state. And then yet we will have an eternal dwelling that God has uh, prepared for us, designed for us. Can't wait to see what that is. And we look to that for our ultimate hope. Um, resurrection, right? Um, so that's the second thing that it reveals about God, that he's got a plan for our bodies. Third, he is to be feared for he will judge us. Verse 10 and 11 of chapter 5 tells us we will all sit before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, I mentioned this on Sunday. Um, we will sit before the judgment seat of Christ. It is not for our condemnation. It is for our judgment. It is like a father uh, that disciplines his children. And we are to act and live in all in respect of our father, that he could discipline us. He could punish us in this life. And certainly we'll sit before Jesus in the next and he will judge us. It's good news. And yet it is also meant to stroke in us or stoke in us a bit of fear. And a bit of awe that, man, like what we do now has eternal consequence. We need to understand that as believers, that it's not, that grace isn't just like, uh, just all forgiveness all the time. It also, Titus says, teaches us to say no to ungodliness. We need to understand that grace is corrective because grace is also, uh, has a judgmental element to it. 
that we need to take hold of in the American church, certainly in the Grove Church as well. Fourth, what does it reveal about God? Right at the end, very clearly, Jesus had no sin, but became sin for us so that we who were sin might become the righteousness of God. It's called the great exchange um, that we took on that he took on, Jesus took on our sin. He took on all of our sin and gave us all of his righteousness. He gave us what we would never earn and what we never deserve. And he took on what he did not earn and what he did not deserve. It was the full wrath of God that was punished and that was given to Jesus so that we could be set free and reconciled to him. What a beautiful picture and a beautiful story. I pray that we never get tired of hearing it. All right, well, what does this now reveal about humans? Well, <clears throat> four things. One, non-believing people are being blinded by the God of this age. Verse four of chapter four says this, in their case, in those that are perishing, in those that do not believe in the gospel, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Friends, your non-believing friends aren't non-believers on accident. The, the, the God of this world, Satan, the one who's ruling uh, really the world uh, in a subservient manner underneath the rule of God the Father and of God the Son who reigns over all things, high, seated high above every power and authority, the Bible says. The God of this age, the ruler of this age, he is blinding the minds and the eyes of non-believers, the hearts of non-believers. They don't believe because Satan has deceived them. So it's our job not to necessarily convince them. Our job is to proclaim the gospel. The Bible does say to persuade them to reconciliation. And we'll get to how we do that here in a minute. But non-believing humans, it is by their very nature, they are being blinded by Satan himself. We must take that into account. When we think about our non-believing friends, it's not that they hate Jesus, it's that they've been convinced that it's wrong. And we need to pray that, that the ultimate Lord of the universe will break down um, the scales of their eyes so they might see Jesus for who he truly is. Two, we are jars of clay. This is an idea um, uh, that as believers, we are, we are fragile, uh, we are imperfect, and we are wasting away. That's kind of the picture of a jar of clay. It would have been an actual jar of clay, a vessel to carry water or light from one place to another. And that's the picture of a believer, that we are jars of clay carrying around the treasure of the gospel through, through imperfect uh, means, through our bodies, through our imperfect proclamations of the gospel. Uh, we are jars, jars of clay. But we don't just stay there, right? We are also new creations. See all these paradoxes in this passage. It's really beautiful the way Paul uh, wrote this out. Um, that we are not just jars of clay. We're also new creations. Um, and as new creations, um, the old is gone and the new has come. And all this is from the Lord. That is an identity statement I have in my Bible in chapter 5, uh, all the way from 17 through actually 6.1. And I just have it all highlighted. And right next to it, I have an ID next to it in my Bible. To remind me, this is an identity statement. This is who we are. It doesn't matter what I feel. This is who I am. I am new in Christ. I am an ambassador in Christ. And that's the fourth thing. We are ambassadors of a message of reconciliation. It's who we are. Now live in light of that, that, that identity, that gospel identity. Don't try to um, earn the identity. It's been earned on your behalf. Now live in light of what God has already earned for you. That's the beautiful good news of the gospel. That's what this text reveals about us. Now, what must we do? Again, about three things here. One, I think throughout this passage, there's this re reiteration that we will not lose heart. Verse one of chapter four, verse 16 of chapter four, we will not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Things are hard. You're going to suffer. You might even be persecuted. Um, you might even feel depression, but, but fear not and, and do not be dismayed because there is hope, not in this world, not in this body feeling better, not in everybody understanding why you're giving them the gospel because they won't, they're, they're, they're blinded. But man, we don't lose heart because God has made some promises to us that the spirit is guaranteeing what is to come, that we have an eternal plan for our bodies and that God, though we do not deserve it, have been reconciled by the blood of Jesus. We do not lose heart. So friends, I don't know what your losing heart in. I'm losing heart. There's some things that I'm losing heart in. It's good to admit it. And it's good to, to put my finger on why is it I feel a certain way. It's because I've lost heart. I've given up on some fruit in ministry um, because I'm impatient. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I don't know what to do here or there. And I may be giving up on trying to find a solution because it's been bothering me for too long. Do not lose heart. Oh, soul, do not lose heart. Do not grow up in doing good. For in due season, you will reap a harvest, Galatians 6 says. In due season, not in the right season, not in the next season. In due season, do not lose heart. Secondly, seek to please God by persuading others of the gospel. I don't know about you, but that just, that's cold water to my soul. Um, I don't know what your life is about, but is it about others or is it just about you? In a selfie world, I think we've lost this idea that we serve God first, we serve others second, and we seek to please ourselves third. That's an old saying that I learned when I was first a believer, like God first, others second, me third. And somehow in the self-care generation, in the self-care world, we've gone, no, 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 we're not going to pursue God until I feel right. We're not going to do anything for others until I start to feel better about myself. I'm going through a season here. That actually is not how it works. Matter of fact, Jesus says, my joy will be made complete in you when you serve one another. It's in John 15. My joy will be made complete in you as you serve one another. Not as when you come to church and feel good about yourselves or when you start to feel good about yourselves, my joy will be good, made, made perfect in you. Hmm. When we serve others, we serve and please God. When we please God by persuading others. Is your life about you or is your life about seeking to please God? Verse 9 of chapter 5. Verse 11 of chapter 5, by persuading others in the gospel. Yes, they're going to think you're crazy. Yes, they're going to call you names behind your back. Yes, they're going to talk about you with someone else that you thought you were better friends with. Yes, they're going to push you out of certain circles. They're not going to invite you to lunch after church because, candidly, your version of the gospel might be too convicting for them. They'd rather just go and do whatever. Or they're not going to invite you out to their house or whatever. Like, whatever. Paul knows that. Paul knows that. And he says, man, so may it be. We carry on this treasure of the gospel in jars of clay. And though we may be wasting away, we are being renewed by the presence and the guarantee of the Spirit. They may even persecute you, but you will not be dissuaded or pressed out uh, by the power and the promises of God. These things are not our hope. Our hope is not found in acceptance. Our hope is found in that we will, be, uh, we will please God by persuading others in leading others, look at it says in verse 15 of chapter 4. I love this. It is for it is all for your sake, for other people's sake, that we're going to be pressed out, that we're going to be persecuted, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to God, and God will get more glory. The whole plan of getting glory for God is that we would be responsible with this treasure of the gospel and persuade others. That's our aim. I pray it is your aim. Seek to aim, seek to please him by persuading others. And then finally, if you are, in, are reconciled, you are an ambassador of reconciliation. Can I, friends, this is going to be a message that we have to tell ourselves again and again and again and again. First, believe in the gospel that you have been reconciled. Reconciled means exchanging hostile relationships for a friendly one. That's what God has done through Christ uh, for you. He has, you were once his enemy, Colossians 1, 21 through 23 tell us. He's reconciled you. He's created a friendly relationship with you. And now you are called to go personify that to others. You preach it and you personify it. That's what we must do as believers. There's not enough of that going around. And we need to do it in the household of God first and then to the world around us. Remember what Jesus said, just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. The whole world will know that you follow me. You're my disciples. If you love one another, may we do so in a reconciling way, heaven bent, that we will stand before him one day as our judge, not just as our father. And we will be able to stand before him and say, Father, we have done all that we can do, seeking to please you, to persuade others to be reconciled to our king. Hope this is helpful. Love y'all. See you soon.